As we all know, the Middle East has been a complex and turbulent part of the world for a very long time. Since the end of the Second World War, we've seen a number of regular wars involving various combinations of most of the nations in the region. Simmering ethnic and religious conflicts have been either a background noise or front page news. But at the moment, as part of or as a result of the Arab Spring, we have a situation in Syria that I think it would be fair to describe as the mother of all proxy wars. Sudden rise of Daesh as a powerful force in Iraq and Syria first surprised us all and then scared us all. And, and uh, we see now the traditional power struggle between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Russians are supporting their client state or person, the Assad regime. And the US is a bit of a timid participant in that war. Turkey and its, may I say so, Turkish uh, Kurdish issue adds to the complexity and it's almost impossible to fathom what's going on. But happily, today uh, there will be light shed on the ambition, ambitions of two of the major players, Iran and Turkey. And we will start by having and welcoming Professor Eitan Yuboa of the Baran, Bar Ilan University in Ramadan. Is that roughly the pronunciation? Yes, that it is. And he will start by giving his view on what's going on with the perspective of Iran and then the senior research fellow will Hali and Karaveli will uh, deal with Turkey. Please go ahead. And of course afterwards there will be Q. The type of warfare that Roger mentioned, thanks Roger, for your introduction to Harry for you have been setting up this this event, uh, we call uh, this type of warfare hybrid war. It exists in the Ukraine, incidentally, not just in the Middle East, Ukraine, Somalia, in, uh, Somali in, in Africa, as well as in Afghanistan uh, and Syria and Yemen. Hybrid war means that it goes up and down, it never ends, it goes through cycles. This is also for, for Gaza, for example. So, I'll be speaking about. Uh, Speaking about about Syria, and we'll go uh, systematically over the start. <coughs> so this is Syria, and in terms of uh, the borders, so you can see here. So you have Turkey here, no border, and you have Iran, uh, Iraq here, and Jordan here, Israel, and the Palestinian territories here, and Lebanon here. So, so you can see you can see the neighbors of, of Syria. But um, what is more interesting is the demographic structure of Syria. So you can see how divided it is. So here you have the Alawites, which is uh, like a Shiite section, 15%, about 15% of, of the Syrians and the ruling, the ruling uh, uh, elite comes from the Alawites. So the problem in Syria has always been the control of the, of the minority over the Sunni majority. So these Sunni, here you have Kurds, here you have Druze, uh, Lebanon is about 60% Shiite. See, this is, this is a, a mosaic of ethnic and national, and national groups, and it's part of the problem. Uh, this is when the Islamic State, Daesh, took over, see, so took over substantial chunks of both Iraq and Syria. This is just to, to show you what happened before. So this is Syria. I mean, you get a headache of this. <laughs> and you don't know who is against whom and for what purpose. Everybody is against terrorism. But everybody had a much more important uh, uh, goal in Syria. Like Turkey, Turkey is interested mostly in the Kurds. And, and so others, um, in, in a similar, so this is this is better. Perhaps this is a better illustration of uh, what was uh, what is happening, what was happening in Syria in the last say five to six years. And here, you know, 
Russia supports your continued dialogue with the people of Syria. Now, this, uh, this be now I want to begin uh, with uh, my main argument or thesis, without which it's extremely difficult to understand what Iran is doing in Syria and perhaps also in the entire region. So this is the story here. Uh, we divide Islam into a number of movements or sections. So these are the Shiite states, Iran and Iraq, and also Lebanon here. These are the Sunni Arab states. There is a whole history of religion and politics and culture between these two main streams of Islam. And without, without this, Again, it's a very difficult to understand what is happening in the region. But Shiites reside elsewhere in the Middle East, not just. So in Iran, 95%, Iraq, 65 to 70% Shiite. Syria, 15, is otherwise, I think it's more 15. Lebanon, it's more like 55. But look here, Kuwait, 20 to 25%, Bahrain, 65 to 75% Shiite, Qatar, 10%. Oman, 5 to 10 percent. Yemen, 35 to 40 percent. <coughs> These are the Houthis, those who are now fighting the Sunni in Yemen. So in Yemen, we see uh, a civil war and uh, regional military intervention because Iran, 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 Iran supports uh, the Houthis, Saudi Arabia supports the Sunnis, so you have like proxy type of uh, proxy warfare uh, that. And uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, 10 to 15 percent Shiites. So the Iran, Iran's ideology is, first of all, to export its extreme Islamic perception uh, of, uh, of Islamic rule, of Islamic theocracy and to replace many of the governments of the Sunni Arab states with other type of governments, more Islamic governments, with which Iran would be able to cooperate. But the whole idea is for Iran to dominate the entire region. And I'll show you later um, how, how this may work. Oh, this is, this is the, what I call the Shia crescent. So what Iran wants to do so this, this is basically the crescent. So you go, you go from Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. So this is part of it. And then you go to these places and Yemen. So the idea is to have this crescent. And this crescent is supposed to crush everything in this direction. So this is, this is the strategy of controlling and dominating the entire region. For Israel, this means a big problem because uh, so Iran is represented here by Hezbollah, which is a Shiite terrorist organization. Then you have Hamas is here. It's Sunni, but still uh, gets uh, much support from Iran. Especially, and there's another organization here called the Islamic Jihad. And what Iran is trying to do is to establish another military presence here to threaten Israel from Syria as well. So the idea for Iran is to, uh, to, uh, uh, to build uh, uh, a wall of, uh, of uh, organizations and movements loyal to them, and probably organizations that would do what they want them to do. And there's also bad news for Jordan here, <coughs> because Iran would like very much to replace the monarchy in Jordan, and since they have, a, they have influence in Syria, and they have influence in Iraq, so Jordan is under threat as well. So this is how Iran uh, manipulates and <coughs> uses Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza. Now these organizations, incidentally, including ISIS, we call them sub-state terror organizations. They are more than a simple terror organization, but less than a state. So it's, uh, it's the Islamic State, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Hamas in Gaza. And what, uh, what uh, characterized them 
They have they control territory. They have headquarters and governmental machinery, and they govern populations. So this is this is a, a new type of political units. Well, Hezbollah. Hezbollah has missiles, 130,000 missiles, more than most of the European countries combined. And they have all kinds of all kinds of missiles, and this is what they cover almost all of Israel. And the problem right now is that what Iran is trying to do, most of these missiles are blind. What, so Iran uh, developed uh, technology to improve these missiles and make them much more accurate. Accuracy means like hitting targets within, say, 100 meters or something like that. But this is a huge uh, threat uh, for Israel, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, because the more the missiles are accurate, the more they are capable of destroying base, uh, military bases, uh, uh, governmental buildings, uh, infrastructure, electricity, water, etc. So this this has become a major a major challenge for Israel. Even in Gaza, this is Yahya Sinwar, who is the military leader of Hamas in Gaza, and this, I, I have just a statement from him. Ties with Iran now fantastic. We are. There was a huge, uh, not a huge, there was some uh, conflict between Hamas and Gaza and the government of Bashar al-Assad because of the violence of the civil war. But now that the civil war in Syria is almost over, not yet fully over, it's almost over, then uh, Sinwa went to Tehran, and this is where he uh, said, made that statement. Ties with Iran now, fantastic. We are preparing battle for Palestine. We would not discuss recognizing Israel, only by pick it out. Now, much of the trouble in Gaza in the last few months was inspired, equipped, and financed by Iran. Because Iran is not interested in any agreement that, um, that Egypt is trying to mediate between a, a, long, a long ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. So they tell Hamas to initiate violence. So Iran is pretty much involved also in Gaza. So these are the missiles. They're not really dealing with Iran. And I, I'm saying all of that because in order to understand the role of Iran in Syria, you have to see the big picture. Now, when I read um, uh, newspaper articles about Syria and Iran, or even scholarly works, the, wide con the wider context is always missing. Uh, things are isolated, so just Syria isolated, uh, the nuclear uh, weapon, the weapons program of Iran is isolated, but in order to understand much of it, you have to look at the big picture. So this is the nuclear deal. These are the nuclear facilities in Iran. The nuclear deal was signed about three years ago. And there were all kinds of assumptions made by the Obama administration about this deal. Now all of these assumptions, obviously you know, we are now five years after the deal. There are all kinds of assumptions that were proving wrong. I thought at the time that it was a bad deal, badly negotiated. Iran is much better in negotiations, perhaps, than any, any other country. If you go to the bazaar in Tehran, they know how to negotiate with you and always get the best price for them. So the Obama administration uh, conducted negotiations with Iran as beginners in, in negotiations. So at the time, I had strong reservations about the deal. But now, after three years, you can show that many of the assumptions made behind the deal were wrong. For example, one of the major assumptions was that the deal would modify Iranians' behavior in the region. Didn't happen. Didn't happen in Syria, didn't happen in Lebanon, didn't happen in Yemen. Simply did not happen. Iran continue to intervene militarily and otherwise. They are, they are trying all the time to use the Shiites in the places, in the states that I've shown to you to rebel against the existing governments, in addition to all of what they were doing elsewhere in the Middle East. Assumption number two was that 
The money that uh, was released as a result of the deal, $120 billion, would be used primarily for domestic purposes so that uh, the people will enjoy the fruits of that agreement. And therefore, perhaps we'll modify the political system in Iran. Never happened. Much of the money went to, uh, went to activities abroad. And in the last few months, we heard demonstrations in Tehran and elsewhere shouting, we don't want this money to go to Syria and Lebanon and Yemen. We want the money to go here. And instead of death to America or death to Israel, they, they uh, shouted death to, to Hamanai and Rouhani, the leaders of Iran. So the money did not go to the places where uh, the West assumed it would go. Third, um, there were all kinds of omissions from the agreement. One big omission was missiles. So the UN resolution, UN Security Council resolution that approved of the deal said that Iran would not, Iran uh, is not permitted to develop and test missiles that can carry uh, nuclear weapons. And Iran is continuing all the time to develop and experiment with missiles. And, but Iran is arguing, oh, these missiles are not designed to carry nuclear weapons. Anybody who knows anything about missiles know that this is a big lie. How do we know? But this is, this is uh, Iran had, had closely collaborated with North Korea on nuclear technology, parts, equipment, as well as uh, missiles. But this is a Hoson 10 North Korean missile. It was developed specifically and only to carry nuclear bombs. This missile, so this was on parade in Pyongyang. And this missile showed up in a parade in Tehran. They call it Koromashar. So they are developing and experimenting with missiles that can carry nuclear weapons. Missiles were not even mentioned in, in the deal. Uh, and if we continue with missiles, so these, these were some of the testing of the missiles, but what is interesting for me, coming from Israel, uh, Jabad Zarif, who has a PhD in international relations from the University of Denver, said the following. He said that in January 2017, Iran will not use ballistic missiles to attack any country. He is the nice faith of Iran. But uh, Iran, uh, so this, this is a test of uh, ballistic missiles. And on the missile here, it's in Persian and in Hebrew, in Persian and in Hebrew, uh, Israel must be wiped out. No contradiction. And just uh, last Saturday, Rouhani, the moderate president of Iran, said, Israel is a cancer in the Middle East and should be eliminated. So for us, uh, given our history, when you have countries threaten you with annihilation, you don't really take it easily, as the case, is, is the case in Sweden and elsewhere. As if they are, these are empty words. These are not empty words. You have to take them very seriously. So in, in, uh, in Syria, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, at least uh, from, the, from the perspective of Israel, the number one goal is to prevent Hezbollah of Lebanon establishing another military base in Syria, close to the Israeli border. The reason for that is very simple. Hezbollah is a Shiite organization following orders from Tehran. The other part of Lebanon, the Christian part of Lebanon, and the Sunni part of Lebanon, don't like this idea because it, it uh, threatens uh, the security of Lebanon. So Hezbollah does not enjoy much legitimacy in Lebanon. Hezbollah fought with the Bashar al-Assad forces and with Russia in the civil war, lost thousands of soldiers there. And people in Lebanon ask, whom do you serve, Lebanon or Iran? But if Hezbollah 
with, with Iran or without Iran is able to establish a military base in Syria itself, then this issue of legitimacy disappears. <coughs> but for Israel, the goal is to prevent that from happening. And the only way you can you can use for this for these kinds of enemies in this kind of situations use force. So Israel used air force to to attack <coughs> all those efforts by Hezbollah and Iran to establish military bases very close to the border, uh, or prevent the establishment of a Syrian equivalent of Hezbollah, because in 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 Syria. There are many uh, um, Shiite militias uh, which were mobilized from very from various parts of the world. Afghanistan, Pakistan, you name it. They do they do much of the warfare. The Iranians are supervising them and prevent uh, sophisticated weapons uh, transfer from Syria from from uh, Tehran via. Damascus to Hezbollah, again, you have to use force, there's no other way. The, the diplomacy does not work here. And so, so there were attacks on, um, on attempts to transfer those accurate missiles and also attack those plants, that, uh, the factories that uh, Iran was building in Lebanon to improve the, the, the existing um, blind um, missiles. Uh, keep uh, the Iranian forces and militias about 40 kilometers from the border. Israel demands, like the United States, and I heard also Putin saying so, withdrawal of all foreign forces. The reference is primarily to Iran. Iran wants to stay there forever. And Israel is collaborating with Sunni and Kurdish groups and with the United States and Russia up to a point. So what, uh, what, was happening, uh, what is happening with Iran? the nuclear deal, as well as the Iranian military interventions in Syria and Yemen in particular, uh, threaten the entire Sunni Arab states and has created what I would call shifting alliances. And so this is uh, what I call the counter Sunni crescent. Remember the Shia crescent? Now this is against. So, which countries um, are members of this of this uh, counter alliance? So you go first of all, countries and Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and Israel. Uh, this is this is the counter the counter Sunni crescent. And this alliance is is quite interesting because for the first time, for strategic reasons. Uh, it created collaboration between Israel and those countries, primarily with uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and, and the Persian Gulf countries, um, and which for them mean uh, an effective way, uh, or more effective way to deal with Iran. They don't trust the United States. They don't trust, obviously, the West. They don't trust uh, the EU uh, for anything because of EU apathy during most of the civil war in Syria, the EU couldn't care less until Erdogan opened the gates and let one million refugees to go into Western Europe. Then they suddenly woke up. What happened a few weeks ago then is a little bit changing uh, the strategic equation in Syria. This, uh, so first, first of all, these are uh, the bases. So, Russia has uh, has an Air Force base and naval base in Latakia, in Tartus, you see here, <laughs> two places, Shairat, which is an Air Force base, T4. So you can see, this is, this is all Russia, right here. This is the United States, right here. This is uh, January 2018, the beginning, beginning of the year. So, this is also the United States right here. United States right here. The United States is involved, although I think Trump, uh, Trump's policy vis-a-vis Syria is very similar to that of Obama. For the United States, the main reason for staying in Syria was to defeat the Islamic State. The assumption is now that uh, ISIS, the Islamic State, was defeated. So 
The United States, as the United States, you finish the job, you go home. And Obama would have gone home. Uh, but because if Obama would have would have gone uh, would have would have taken American forces from Afghanistan and Iran long time ago, years ago, uh, the challenge of the Islamic State forced him to to delay that withdrawal from from the Middle East. And the United States is here. The United States is now saying, Trump would have liked to take out all of these forces. The United States is now saying that it would not withdraw until everybody else withdrew from Syria, meaning Iran and the Russians. The U.S. policy towards Syria and towards Iran in Syria uh, have been inconsistent. Because you cannot cancel the nuclear deal with Iran, which Obama, which uh, Trump did, and impose new sanctions on Iran. More recently, at the beginning of the month, tougher sanctions on oil and gas, and still be completely indifferent towards Iranian attempts to build military presence uh, and, and to dominate Syria after the end of the civil war. It was inconsistent. So, uh, but what happened a few weeks ago to this airplane? Looks old, very slow. Was shut down by Syrian uh, Air Force uh, mi uh, batteries, missiles. That went down. It was a Russian plane shut down by Syria following an, an Israeli attack on some targets in, inside Syria. I, I happen to believe, I haven't seen it in many places, I happen to believe that this was done on purpose. For all kinds of reasons, this is such a slow plane, you cannot think that this is a comeback, a, a modern comeback. No, Syria said, oh, we thought that this is an Israeli uh, combat over. You know, you may be not that professional, but you can see that this is not a modern combat uh, over. So, shut it down in order to create a conflict between Russia and Israel. Because Russia permitted Israel to attack certain, you know, the rules of the game were that you will play a game. Yes, you are concerned about, about the Iranian um, uh, plans to establish permanent military presence in Syria. You are concerned about the transfer of weapons uh, to Hezbollah, which we may not like that much. So, so the, the certain rules of the game were established, and Israel and, and, and Russia even established a coordinated military mechanism to avoid mistakes of that, you know, that kind. And this military coordinating body was pretty, pretty effective. Even at the time of this particular attack, you know, the Russians are saying that they received a warning uh, too late, but this is not true. And in retaliation, Russia sent uh, S-300 sophisticated anti-aircraft anti -aircraft, uh, missiles to Syria, R Russia itself, there's the S-400 anti-combat uh, anti, um, aircraft um, defense system, and, but they've never used it. Uh, so this upgraded to a point the Syrian military, uh, military def uh, air defense. So since then, there are all kinds of, uh, Israel is less, has less freedom to operate in Syria to accomplish its strategic goals. So now we see more of some diplomatic activity, like shifting alliances. Remember the Sunni Crescent? Just a few weeks ago, uh, Israel Prime Minister met uh, Sultan Qaboos uh, in the Persian Gulf. And this is an interesting, my interpretation of it uh, is that yeah, the whole idea of that counter Sunni Crescent um, uh, uh, received a, a major blow as a result of the murder of Hashugi in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. This was a terrible thing to do. Especially when the person is a reporter, commentator, residing in Washington, writing for the Washington Post, and you know, whether he in Saudi Arabia and consulate in, in, in Istanbul, this, not only this is uh, morally wrong, it was also stupid. You don't know that. 
So now there's a crisis uh, around that event. Uh, also, Trump, Trump would like to continue the good relations with um, Mohammed bin Salman and, and, and with the MBS, it is called. So for him, this was, this was, this was um, a huge challenge. We're still waiting to see who is responsible, who is not responsible. The CIA has determined that uh, MBS was directly responsible for the matter. But this, uh, the, the murder, has weakened the counter Sunni crescent. So I think this particular visit of Israel Prime Minister to uh, with, with, with Kabus, uh, Oman, and remember Oman is no Oman is very close to Yemen, very close to to to, the, to to that strategic area of the Saudi Arabia, the Arabia Peninsula. I think this, uh, and I did not expect the picture to come out of this. This is the picture. Rarely you see a picture like this. Because these early prime ministers visit Egypt for time to time. You, you never see real pictures. This is this. So this is a this. The picture is, or the meeting is the message. And the message is, despite the weakening position of Saudi Arabia in the Sunni contra crescent. Uh, this alliance is developing and even strengthening. And, uh, and we'll see how, how Saudi Arabia will get out of it. But uh, one of the uh, perhaps uh, strange outcomes of all, what, of, all, of all what I've said is this alliance, uh, with support of the United States, this alliance uh, between the Sunni Arab countries and Israel, which includes, again, Egypt, Jordan, which have peace agreements with Israel, Persian Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, and the only goal of that alliance is to block Iran. Uh, this, members of this alliance don't trust anymore the United States. Obama, create, Obama uh, defined Iran as a potential ally of the United States and uh, deserted in the eyes of these countries, deserted, and, and those uh, traditional pro-American Sunni Arab states, and therefore there's a lot of suspicion about, even about Trump, there's a lot of suspicion in those, in, in those, in those countries. They say uh, we have to care for ourselves and not depend on anybody else. So we go back to, uh, to the comment I made earlier. So I see, because mainly, mainly because of Iran, uh, I see because we'll see how the second round of sanctions, which Europe is trying to undermine, we can go a little bit later to that, uh, how these sanctions are going to uh, influence Iran, and whether or not uh, Iran will continue with military interventions and manipulations and undermining of governments in the region, and, uh, and to what extent then uh, this all will affect uh, the counter the counter Shiite uh, crescent. But what we should expect is this kind of hybrid warfare that would continue as long as uh, actors in the region would think that uh, this type of warfare serves uh, the main interest. Thank you very much. It may appear to be a little odd combination that we are talking about today here um, Iran, Israel, and Turkey. Would have maybe you know if we had had opportunity possibility we would have had a conference with all the car all the countries involved and then they would have needed of course a day and perhaps more than a day to cover all these aspects. Uh, <clears throat> but the previous talk actually gave a lot of uh, uh, provided a lot of interesting uh, food for thought, which I will include uh, in my presentation as well. Now, <clears throat> my intention was to give a short overview of uh, Turkey's ambition in, 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 in Syria, in parallel, sort of, to Iran's ambition in Syria. And, and uh, so, by the way, I just forgot, sorry, I need to show this. <clears throat> Now, this is my recently published book, 
and I call Turkey, why Turkey is authoritarian, published by Pluto Press in the UK. And uh, just as I had finished the book, uh, Turkey is, uh, uh, incursion or invasion or intervention or whatever you call it into Afrin and Syria, into the Kurdish one, into the enclave of Afrin took place. And uh, the publisher asked me to, to uh, write the, an additional chapter covering this most recent event. And, and I wrote a short afterward where you, those of you who are interested can may, may consult the book uh, where I kind of give a, a, a resume of Turkish Syrian adventure, and afterwards it's called Attacking the Kurds, the Return of Kemalism. And uh, <clears throat> because the idea, as you know, has been for since the Erdogan and Sparta came to power, that Turkey had rejected supposedly this Kemalist past and embarked on a new path. And, uh, and in a way, um, the Turkish adventure in Syria has proven you know, that, 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 that that is no longer true, that Kemalism, that the legacy of Ataturk is still alive. Now, Turkey's ambitions in Syria, they, they, um, they go way back to 1938, when Syria was a French mandate. And uh, Atatürk's last act in life, died in 1938, was to make sure he was to intimidate the French and uh, to 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 uh, hand over the the Sanjak of uh, Alexander Alexander today's province of Hatay in Turkey to Turkey, which took place a year afterwards, 1939. Now Hatay. Today's Atai was then an Arab majority province. So Turkey had no you know, legitimate reason to, 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 to covet it. Other than the fact that Ataturk, who, who uh, being the military man, looking at the map, knew that Turkey would be potentially vulnerable for an invasion from the Eastern Mediterranean, by this from the Eastern Mediterranean, unless it controlled Hatay. So this was a very classical geopolitical reasons for Turkey to wanting to have that province. And for, the, for decades, Syria never accepted that. In all official maps of Syria, Hatay was always included. I don't, I don't know how it is recently, but it used to be like that anyway. That Hatay was always included in Syria. And uh, so this kind of a geopolitical reason for wanting to have that part of Syria has been revived today. So what we are seeing at play in, in Syria when it comes to Turkey is kind of a revival of classical Kemalist, as I call it, geopolitics. By that, I mean I understand the kind of defensive nature of what Turkey is doing. Turkey fears for fear that the integrity of its Anatolian heartland is threatened. And in order to prevent a, a, a threatening uh, partition, it has to take countermeasures. And it did in 1938, annexing Hatay, Alexandria, and today, venturing into Syria and de facto uh, annexing Afrin and uh, uh, mean also aspiring to do the same along its, its border. Now, if you look at it from the Turkish point of view, uh, just as you described here how Israel looks at the map and sees the Iranians building up <coughs> A, a threat along Israel's borders, so has Turkey legitimate reasons to fear what's happening. Now, it has a 900 kilometer border, it's the longest border, land border, Turkey's longest land border with, anyone, is with Syria. And most of that border today is under the control of Kurdish militias. 
Kurdish militia that are uh, closely affiliated with, more or less identical with the Kurdistan Workers Party PKK, which has been uh, conducting insurgency against Turkish, uh, the Turkish state since 1984. Now, the PKK in Turkey, which is, you know, uh, I am not taking any sides of this matter, just, just giving you as an objective information. It says, this is a terrorist organization by the United States and the EU. And this organization is identical with the so called PYD or APG, different names are called, that is operating in Syria and is controlling northern Syria, the so called Rojava. Rojava, which means Western Kurdistan. Now, just as Israel cannot accept Iranian, you know, Iranians establishing themselves in Syria, so can Turkey not accept the establishment of a Kurdish state alongside the southern border. Southern border. Now, there is a, you could ask, you know, well, the Turks have, you know, eventually accepted the uh, Kurdish autonomous region in Iraq. Why not? Why can't they accept it in Syria? Okay, they will gradually eventually do so. Some, some, it, 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 some speculate or surmise. But there are, there are differences because the, the Kurds in Iraq, uh, in, in tribal terms, are not as closely related to the Kurds in Turkey as the Kurds in Syria are. Now, the Syrian, Syrian Kurds and the Kurds in, in Turkey are the same. Okay? So, they is, the, so the establishment of a, of a Kurdish state in Syria, and also the fact that this is a direct 900 kilometer long border, will, have a, will inevitably have a direct impact on Turkey's internal security. And it's a order to have so. Now, pausing there for a moment, returning to what Turkey did in 2011 and 2012, when the civil war or the Islamist rebellion in Syria started. Now, back then, Turkey, together with the United States, Ahmed Davutoglu, who was the foreign minister, together with his partner, Hillary Clinton, held the holding meetings in Washington and in Ankara, preparing the transitional power to so-called moderates. Now, the Obama administration pretended to think that these guys who have started the rebellion are, are, are moderates. You know, this is disingenuous. They must have known it, that everyone else knew that these are Islamists. But, okay, but the Turks uh, knew very well who they were. And the whole point of the Turkish involvement there was to bring the Muslim Brotherhood, Ikhwan al Muslim, to power in Damascus. As part of, because the, the ruling party in Turkey was ideologically kind of, is ideologically affiliated with the Ikhwan al Muslim. And they also saw this as a kind of a realization of the neo Ottoman dream that Turkey was going to be the new Ottoman Empire, ruling over the Sunni Arabs. But this was a pipe dream. But this was what Turkey thought in 2011 and 2012. They felt encouraged when Barack Obama said, Bashar Assad must go. Great. Let's cooperate. CIA moves weapons from, from, uh, from, from uh, Libya, taken over after the uh, killing of Gaddafi, over to the Turkish ports, from which CIA operate, operatives have stations established alongside the Turkish-Syrian border where they meet up. People come from Syria, nice moderate rebels, enjoying their, they say, are you moderates? Yes, where are your weapons? I said, this is how it started. Now, later on, the Americans got cold feet. Mm, maybe these are not so moderate. Maybe this is not such a good idea to hand over Syria to, 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 to uh, you know, <laughs> to an Islamist regime. But the Turks continued supporting, and dissension started between the two allies, between Washington and Ankara. But Turkey was pursuing two goals. One was to bring the Muslim Brotherhood to power in Damascus. Two, to check the ambitions of the Kurds. Because very, very early, the Kurds had established their autonomous region 
as soon as the war started in Syria. In 2012, the summer of 2012, uh, Turkey, uh, the, 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 the Islamist group Jabhat al-Nusra, this is later on as terrorists by the United States, attacked the Rojava region from Turkey. This was the beginning. Turkey used the Islamist rebels. And Obama was furious. Because that, that, they, he thought that now you are going too far. But Erdogan had reason to be furious with him. Because he said, you, you said Bashar al-Assad must go. You encouraged us. And now uh, no, we went in. And why are you having cold feet now? So oh, there was a kind of a mutual misunderstanding or lack of understanding between Washington and Ankara. But don't forget, the United States and Turkey were in this together from the beginning. The United States pretending to wanting to bring moderates to power. Whether or not maybe they actually thought that these Islamists were moderate, I don't know. Now, now of course, then the, the two allies fell out. Because Turkey continued to support this uh, radical Islamist groups, partly of ideological reasons, but mostly out of geopolitical reasons, because they were the tools that Turkey needed to beat the Kurds with. But Turkey was also, at the same time, operating along a different track, also trying to co-opt the Kurds, thinking that maybe the Turkish state elite was thinking maybe we could use the main Ottoman dream and the idea of Muslim brotherhood, Islamic brotherhood, to bring the Kurds under us. Officials of the Turkish National Security Agency talked openly about that, saying that uh, Turkey, Turks and Kurds together, if, you know, as partners, we will be ruling Syria, we will be ruling Iraq. And they used the leader, imprisoned leader of, of PKK, Abdullah Öcalan, who, who wrote a message, actually, for the Turkish intelligence chief, Hakan Fidan, who ghost wrote that message, but it was read out in the name of Öcalan in 2013 at this celebration of Nevruz, the Kurdish Persian New Year, where Öcalan uh, referred to the historical uh, brotherhood between Turks and Kurds, who had, he said, marched under the banner of Islam for 1,000 years, and we're now going to rule the Middle East together. <clears throat> so this was the Turkish, so it's not a combination of the neo-Ottoman dream and the kind of classical Kermanist geopolitics, wanting to, to, to preserve, the protect the integrity of Anatolia. It didn't work. The, the Turkish state soon realized that it's not going to work, because their assumption was that the Kurds were going to be subservient to Turkey. No. This was not going to be that they realized, because in Rojava, the Kurds had become empowered, and they had, under the, on, under the, uh, uh, the, the, the cover of the ongoing so-called peace process with the Turkish state, the PKK had become entrenched in southern Turkey as well. It was stockpiling arms. I was in Ankara 2014. I talked to Turkish state officials. They were furious. They said, how long is this going to continue? The Kurds have taken over the region. This has to stop. And eventually it did. Erdogan broke off the peace process, restarted the war, and here we see another thing happening. The effect of what is happening in Syria, the empowerment of Kurds, precipitated two things in Turkey. Or one thing in Turkey, interior, when it comes to interior Turkish politics, and second, when it comes to exterior relations. Interior-wise, Erdogan aligned himself with the Kemalist Turkish nationalist military. Okay? And here we see that in the summer of 2014, the Turkish chief of the staff warned the government, saying that they, by that, back then, the Turkish government was pursuing so called peace talks with the Kurds, with the PKK. The, uh, the Turkish chief general, top general, said, if this continues, you, if you cross our red lines, warning the government, we will take measures. Summer of 2014, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying that the Turkish military is reasserting its power. Nobody believed me. Everyone was thinking the Turkish military is out of the game, Erdogan has democratized the country, military doesn't matter, all these things that people believe in, you know. Conventional wisdom. Okay? So and people laughed at what I wrote. 
They did laugh two years later when they were at school. Event. Now, but half a year later, in 2015, February, the Turkish state Erdogan, very interestingly, signed a document. The Kurdish politicians went to the island where Erdogan was, is, is held prisoner, came back with a piece of paper saying that we are going to give autonomy to the Kurds, blah, blah, blah. And the, the vice deputy pre, pre, uh, the prime minister of Turkey signed that document in the former imperial palace, Dolmabahce in Istanbul, February 2015. And what happened two weeks ago? Erdogan threw that paper away. It's not going to happen, so. And everyone, and, and no one really understood what happened. As I see it, the coup took place now. That was the moment, February, March 2015, when the Turkish military had a serious talk, as I believe it, with Erdogan, telling him, hey, guy, this is not going to work. They are taking over the Southeast, that you are handing them the autonomy back off. They had already warned him in 2014 about this. Now this happened. Now this happened because of the Kurdish empowerment in Rojava. So it kind of had this effect of altering the political balance in Turkey and pushing Erdogan into a new alliance with the military. And of course, that is the present regime in Turkey is that now. Erdogan is a spokesperson of the Turkish right-wing nationalist regime. Okay, it's a kind of return of Kemalism, the legacy of this guy, this book, is a lot of kicking. The second consequence of what happened was when it came to Turkey's exterior relations with the United States. We saw the map before, all these American flags, northern Syria, American bases. Just a week ago, the Americans announced that we are going to establish posts uh, uh, along the Turkish border. The Turkish defense minister, Hulusi Akkar, the former chief of the general staff, by the way, he is the strong man of the Turkish regime. Uh, he said that it is, I will just quote it directly here, saying that, pointing out in polite terms, he said that we are unhappy with our, what our ally United States are doing. This will create the impression that United States militarily uh, uh, defends Kurdish uh, protects Kurdish terrorists. We expect that the allied United States will immediately severe its relations with the Syrian branch of the PKK. These are the words, these are, you know, last week, Hulusi Akkar, the Turkish defense minister, and the interior minister, so they must sort of say the Americans Remember, the Americans are the allies of Turkey, NATO allies. The United States is cooperating with terrorists. <laughs> now, these are not diplomatic words, but I, I honestly think that the Turks have every reason to say these words, making those statements. They are not exaggerated. This is exactly what the United States is doing. Now, the question what I thought when you talk was, what is the United States up to in Syria? As I see it, they want to establish Rojava as a staging point not only to, now, uh, the IS is beaten, and they will have a foothold in the region to use for, I don't know what, different purposes. Could be with, against Iran, could be against Turkey, I don't know. Now, as far as Turkey sees it, a Kurdish state, PKK state, is being established in Syria under the umbrella of the United States. Now, are you surprised that Turkey is deepening its ties with Russia? There's a faction within the Turkish military. The Turkish military is divided basically between two factions, classical right-wing nationalists and so-called Eurasian nationalists who are more interested in moving Turkey closer to, to Russia. And I don't know, and, and that group is supposedly quite strong within the military. I know that the <coughs> defense minister, the kind of strong military strongman of Turkey, Hulusi Akkar, is more of a classical Turkish right-wing nationalist. He is not really pro-Russia. He, he tries to keep stay close to the United States. But the question in Turkey, if this continues, is going to be: we can very well envision 
a kind of a fight within the Turkish military between the two factions, the more kind of pro-American faction and the more pro-Russian faction. And that will depend on what happens in Syria, what happens with the Kurds, and how the Americans act. Now, another thing that I talked about listening to you, I thought was, well, the first thing was, what is the United States, US plan? What's the game plan in Syria? The second is, you said, talked about Turkey and the crescent, the Sunni crescent. And you seem to be including Turkey in that. Did I understand that correctly? Sort of, yeah. Now, where do we place Turkey, actually? You know, where, yeah, it's a Sunni state, and it has enjoyed, initially, when it, at the start of the Syrian conflict, Turkey did enjoy cooperate, good relations with Saudi Arabia. They were all working to bring the Islamists to power, after all, in Syria. So, of course, they were allies, but then they fell out. I'm not going to get into all those intricate details about that, but there is still kind of a, what, there are ideological differences in so far as Saudi Arabia and Turkey, Saudi Arabia is against the Muslim Brotherhood, and Turkey is behind the Saudi the Muslim Brotherhood. So th there you have kind of ideological shift within the crack, which within the Sunni alliance or Sunni grouping. Secondly, Turkey has major issues with, for instance, Egypt. Egypt is, si Egypt is siding with all of Turkey's enemies. Cyprus, Greece, when it comes to energy exploration in the Eastern Mediterranean. Egypt is not Turkey's friend, okay? So, uh, and Saudi Arabia is not either. Just two weeks ago, intelligence reports suggest that the, a, a, a contingent of Sunni Arabs arrived from a non-specified Gulf country to northern Syria to help the Kurds in Mojave. Also, two weeks ago, Turkey bombed uh, uh, Kurdish positions to which the Americans reply by reinforcing their special forces there. So the Americans, there's kind of a proxy war going on there between Turkey and America. And what you see is Saudis are behind supporting the Kurds. Israel, as you said, pointed out, also supports the Kurds. Now, this puts, where does this put Turkey? It puts Turkey firmly in the Iranian camp. Okay? Because your enemies are my enemies. Okay? And uh, Turkey has reason to kind of side with Iran in this matter because all of Iran's enemies are also Turkey's enemies. United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia. Second, Turkey needs Iranian support in order to beat the Kurds. In Iraq, Turkey has been mounting a slow operation since March this year to capture Kandil, the headquarters of the PKK in northern Iraq. It's not going so well. And that operation's success depends on having Iranian support. Because Kandil, the mountain is, you cannot defeat that without having Iranian support for it. If, doesn't, if the Iranians don't accept it, that operation will be half finished. So in order to finish off the PKK in northern Iraq, Turkey needs Iranian cooperation for purely geographical reasons. Secondly, Iranians have, have historically been very good at using the Kurdish card against Turkey. PKK has on and off enjoyed Iranian support. So Turks have also reason to fear the Iranians that, you know, if it does something, they will hit us with the Kurdish card. So, to sum it up, uh, we are kind of ending up with <laughs> Turkey, and that, that of course raises the question: What is the wise thing to do in Syria today? So, the, what is there a wise alternative other than continuing this? Because this will be, you know, as I see it from the Turkish perspective, this continues. Turkey will get, you know, move more and more away from this, what is left of the Western Alliance, move more in the in the Russian direction, and then of course this is something that. And of course, the Iranian factor. So the question that needs to be asked is, is, is this policy, an American, Israeli policy of supporting the Kurds in Syria this way, is this really a wise policy? And I will end there. Thank you. If I may uh, put a sort of what if question to you. If you try to take religion out of the equation, would you and take ISIS out of the equation, the equation, the equation of this, but if 
compute religion out of the equation, would there be still the same power geopolitical struggle? Okay. Uh, no. Uh, I think part of it is um, the classic power politics. Yeah. Uh, Iran and Iraq and, and Turkey uh, want to restore uh, the hegemonial positions uh, they held back history. You know, uh, Adwan described himself as a new sultan, something like that, right? And, and Iran wants to, to go back to, to uh, the Persian Empire. And this would be an interesting question, to what extent they are on a collision course, eventually, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. further in the future. Uh, because both wants to dominate the entire region. Now, I think that um, this is the problem in the West of ignoring history, culture, and religion. Okay. Why? Because all of these are powerful drivers. So maybe we would have had a power politics game in the Middle East that may resemble some of what is what has been happening there. But religion makes it much more extreme. So um, what I'm, um, my answer is that perhaps uh, some of the interventions, some of the interests, some of the policies would be similar. But religion is such a powerful driver that increases and amplifies the interventions and perhaps the violence and the confrontations and the inability of diplomacy to deal with all of that. Mm -hmm. And I think this comes also into Israeli-Palestinian and Israeli-Arab. When, when you uh, introduce religion as a factor, resolution becomes much harder. Would you agree? Yeah, I generally agree. Uh, you know, the, the religious aspect, the, the, as I said, the Sunni religious aspect was really important in the beginning when Turkey intervened in, in, in Syria. But it, the course of events have now shown that, you know, classical, you know, as I call the Kemalist geopolitics has. has is, has become much more. It, it, it's what determines Turkey's behavior. And when it comes to you know dominating, the Turkey's kind of the imperative for Turkey is now to protect Anatolia, which has always been. The, this is why I said the return of Kemal. The Kemal's foreign policy, the Turkish foreign policy, until recently was about just you know preserving Turkey as a, as a unified state. No adventures, no ideological, religious, or whatever adventures. So Turkey has returned to that point. They are they are just you know keeping Anatolia intact. That is really what they're that, that that's their mission. That, that's their objective imperative. But sometimes local and limited objectives require a grand design. So this is the thing, because you you would say to yourself, okay, in order you know for Iran, Iran sometimes say in order to survive, yeah, we need to, <laughs> we need to be aggressive. We need we need to, to dominate areas. So the, the, so you yeah. walk on a thin line here exactly. between a limited protection of Anatolia and, and and wishing to be much more dominating. And if you take the, the Kurdish issue, you have Syria, you have Iraq, you have Iran. So it, it goes into Absolutely. it goes into different parts of the Middle East. It's not so it's it's not it's not becoming like limited to just one zone. Absolutely. And I would say religion. I would say national. If you think nationalism, absolutely, that is the kind of a import. Yeah. That is a driving force today, and which is you know, maybe we'll see a Turkey annex, you know, north, northern Syria in order to expand, in order to be as I, you know, just as you say, expand in order to be secure. Just one more question. Uh, you mentioned the grand design, uh, and this might be opening up a new seminar. Uh, what is the grand or long-term strategy of Russia, do you think? Okay, so Russia. Uh, Russia uh, entered Syria for, for two opposite, opposite, um, um, result, uh, two opposite um, uh, perhaps reasons. One is to exploit the American willingness to withdraw from the area. So you have an opportunity. So vacuum does not exist. When, when one uh, power goes out, another one comes in. 
So this is this is the idea. So it's the, to first of all to protect the Bashar al-Assad regime because uh, Russia invested a lot in him. Number one. Number two it is to take or to take uh, over uh, the region from the United States because if you first of all you show that you are the strong man of the region. The United States is getting out. Is timid. Is afraid. Is getting out. Uh, remember that, uh, and I think that there was a crucial turning point here, and that was when Obama set a red line and told Bashar al-Assad, if you use again chemical weapons, I'm going to attack you. And then, th th this is very foolish to do. If you don't intend to fulfill your, your, your promise, you don't mark red lines in, in strategy. You don't do that if you have no intention of, of, of doing it. So what, what Obama did, is to transfer the whole issue to Congress, which meant cut out. So who bailed him out? Russia. Because Russia arranged that agreement, yeah. Bashar al-Assad's survival, for dismantling his chemical weapons. This was a Russian, a Russian uh, uh, proposal. So, but in the Middle East, everybody perceived Russia now to be the strong power. So you go to Russia. And you go to Putin. So this was this was the second reason that you want to, to you want to reduce American power, and you want to succeed America in the entire region. And Syria became the vehicle to do that. And third, this is like you have you have like a, a balancing act here. Russia has an account to settle with the West for the Ukraine. So you intervene in Syria in order to obtain assets to, in, to exert pressure on the West. So at one time, I thought that maybe Trump would reach a deal with Putin, like uh, we will make some concessions in the Ukraine in return for some concessions from your side on the Middle East. It didn't happen, partly because of that cloud of the Russian alleged intervention in the presidential elections of 2016. But there, there's a potential there, a diplomatic potential that could be realized. So the Russian, the Russian then motivation was to exploit an opportunity to establish long-term interests in the region and beyond. I, 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 I agree with that, but the thing is that personal, I have a little problem with the uh, not what we, we do said, but with the general attitude of Russia, especially in this country, in Sweden, quite Russian public country, and and the and the and the uh, in, in the Western discourse about Russia. Now, there's absolutely no reason to idolize any country or Russia for that matter. Neither, as I see, it, is there any reason to demonize country. And I think that there's a lot of demonizing going on when it comes to Russia in the West. Now. You could tell this story, you know, you could start the, st the story that you told much earlier. You, you could, you know, you could go on, right, just short, keep it short. We could start with, with the end of the Soviet Union and the deal that Gorbachev felt that he had struck with the Bush administration, uh, Elvin Bush, about the uh, Eastern enlargement, non-enlargement of NATO. And the feeling that the Russians, legitimately or not, had that they were betrayed by the West and it's, you know, it's, you know it, 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 if you ask reformist Russians like Gorbachev, they certainly feel that they were let down by the West, that the West missed an opportunity to build an inclusive relationship with Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. Go on, fast forward to the intervention in Kosovo, 1999, taking place against the UN in it, it, without having a U, UN uh, um, resolution. It was not against the UN, it but was it, without UN Security Council so authorization. Authorization. And then we continues to build up. And when the Russians consented, and the Chinese also, uh, to the intervention in Libya, the, which they thought were going to be a limited intervention, but turned out to be a kind of regime change, I mean, kind of an opening the gates and handing Libya over to Islamists. Uh, and and, and uh, allegedly Putin was, you know, had 
seen the video how, how Gaddafi was lynched and, and, and was, you know, in the deep mood by that and, and felt uh, threatened. So there are reasons, you could say, all of this, what you're saying is correct, but let's, let us not forget what I'm trying to say. Let us not forget the responsibility of the West, of the United States, starting with the fall of the Soviet Union, in building up this kind of animosity, a very kind of unnecessary, if you want, which would not, it, it would, maybe it would have happened anyway, the rival way between Russia and the United States. But there, were, there was an opportunity after the fall of the Soviet Union to build something different. The West neglected that. The West basically rolled over Russia. Okay? And the Russians finally said, stop. And I personally, I find it very difficult to object to the Russian intervention in Syria, which stopped IS from taking over Damascus. The Americans were handing over Syria. The Americans are, excuse me for saying this, extremely stupid superpower. What they have done in the Middle East since the 1990s has been catastrophic. Handing, intervening in Iraq, invading Iraq, handing it over to Iran, and then starting and trying to re, re, kind of correct that mistake, but almost intervening in Syria. So you know, and and then almost handing over Syria to Islamists. So. It, it seems that you know Russians, at least they know what they are doing. And I personally, I feel grateful. I think we all should feel grateful that the Russians actually stopped the Islamists from taking over Syria. The only problem here is the cost: seven hundred thousand people killed. Yeah, but the, the ones who started that war were the Americans and the Saudis and the Turks, pouring in weapons to the Islamist rebels. These are the guilty ones. Obama, Hillary Clinton. Good. I'm, I'm grateful that Hillary Clinton win, win the election. She would have invaded Syria. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was struck a couple of years ago, I was in Washington, and an otherwise sensible guy in, in a think tank told me that, oh, I'm so sorry we didn't invade Syria. What? Did you learn anything from Iraq? This cowboy mentality? So who is the problem in the world today? In the Middle East, the Middle East is, it's not Russia. But looking long term perspective, from 1990, it's the United States. Oh, I'm sorry I brought Russia in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a, an anecdote. I was in the US, I think, watching a, one of those talk shows. And it was this um, retired uh, British lady ambassador. She described the um, American view of foreign policy like Wild West. When the bad guys get into town, we gather the posse, chase them out of town, hang them in a tree, and it's all over. Mm -hmm. Problem with that, it's never all over. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a number of hands, please. Would so, you please start by identifying yourself? I'm Haska Kavaza, Embassy of Georgia. So there are some, some ideas, some questions, but I'll try to be short. The first question is, how do you think regarding Syria? We remember, anyway, I myself belong to this generation who remembers Afghanistan. Can we make some parallel between Afghanistan and Syria now? Because what happened after Afghanistan, we know the Soviet Union collapsed. And it wasn't just political and strategic, it was economic problem. Actually, as, let's say, former Soviet, what we know, Soviet Union, Collapse, not Gorbachev, but economic statistics, mainly. It was the first reason. So, parallel between Afghanistan and Syria. And second question, precisely to Turkey, because it's our neighbor, it's our strategic partner. And uh, can you tell me what Ataturk and Erdogan has common, and what's the difference between them? Okay, uh, I, can, I can address the, the first question. And this is what I meant by hybrid war plan. Um, I think after what happened in Syria, it's very difficult to imagine how, uh, how a Bashar al-Assad regime would be capable of, of reconstruction, which would take decades. If you look at Syrian cities, are completely destroyed. It would take decades, it would take uh, trillions of dollars over, I don't know, maybe a generation, maybe 20, 25, 30 years. And on the other hand, there are all kinds of conditions running against it. 
because the war uh, uh, caused so much damage, to, to, so much uh, loss of life, that it will take uh, years to build some trust. And we hear all kinds of talks about, about reconstruction, and I think that it's going to be very difficult uh, to do. The United States, for example, is saying, well, we will give money only if you accept our conditions. We, you know, especially Trump. Trump is a businessman. He, is, he, is, uh, he, is, he puts his hands on, 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 the, on public money, and he will not give money uh, in, in the absence of influence. So there are too many actors involved in, in theory, and you know, we have seen that. Too, too many actors with, um, with opposite interests, and they will continue to fight each other. So you have, you have external, which means Russia, United States, maybe Europe to a certain extent. You have regional, which is, which is Saudi Arabia and Turkey and others, and you have the local movements. So the local movements um, uh, are not completely independent. They receive support and they receive encouragement from the outside regional and external powers. And as long as this is the situation, the prospects for, for reconciliation inside Syria and reconstruction, which depends on reconciliation, this is not South Africa uh, after apartheid where reconciliation was a key for everything. So I'm very pessimistic about, about the, the, the future, of, of future of Syria. Uh, because I don't see, I, I think it will, it will take, we will see a, a, a period of transition from civil war to hybrid war, like all kinds of eruptions from time to time. Even, even the Islamic State is not yet fully destroyed. Islamic State has all kinds of places on the border between Iraq and, and Syria, and this is not yet fully over. And I think that the Islamic State uh, is building itself in other places. And Afghanistan is far from, you know, Afghanistan is not far from that. Afghanistan could be also a major source of conflict because of, of, of the Taliban against, against the central government there. So, um, so, so the, the condition, so the, the period of transition either will lead to better conditions for reconciliation or to reconstruction, or to another eruption of civil war. And I think they have equal chance. These, these scenarios they have equal chance of, of uh, flaring out the eruption. If Turkey annexes northern Syria, you, know, you, have a, a, you have a new ball game. Altogether, I think I I, I was I would consider that a, a quite likely outcome actually that Turkey will take over northern Syria, uh, and the uh, no. Let me just say that this is the, this happens. You, you know, in, in the last five or six years, because of the so-called Arab Spring mm -hmm. and the civil wars in a number of places, uh, Syria and Iraq and to a certain extent other places were uh, were key. You know, the territories were drawn by the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1960. <laughs> 1960. But the British and the French simply you know, yeah. took a ruler line on the back, back, this line, that line, without any consideration for history, culture, and religion. So look at Syria, look at Iraq, the compass of Lebanon. So, uh, so, what, what, so um, at the beginning uh, of, of, of the civil wars, we were witnessing this integration of the borders, of the borders imposed on the region by the colonial European powers. And if, if Anatolia is an ex, so, so the sacred rule of the 20th century after the Second World War is you don't touch international borders. You keep, you keep sovereignty, like the most sacred thing. And therefore, when, uh, you know, for Iraq, for example, the solution would have been to divide Iraq into three states, yeah. Kurdistan and the Shiite in, in, in the south, and Sunni in the middle. But, but 
this cannot be done because of the, of the sacred nature of international borders. If Anatolia is taken by Turkey, this is going to break that principle. And I think it may lead to... I think it was made what what just, uh, yeah. just 10 years ago in Georgia, yeah. when borders were. Yeah. So it has happened already. If that happened, then, then we should expect all kinds of redrawing in the Middle East. Uh, no, also, you could also argue that you know when the Americans invaded Iraq, you know this, you know, okay, what did they, you know, what did the borders matter there, sort of. And also, without getting too much into Iraq, I believe that Iraq has actually proven to you know the Arab kind of solidarity between over transcending the Sunni Shiite divide. It, as you see, interaction against the Kurds, uh, you see this kind yeah, of holding yeah, together yeah, that yeah. Iraq has proven to have sort of a kind of bonding there, transcending that uh, sectarian divide. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing with Syria, is I, I think that we have to think this, you know, in a very, uh, this is not a, uh, there's a tendency to think about international things like uh, we're sitting at a diplomatic conference, we have these tools, uh, reconciliation, fixing, it's not going to happen. Syria is not the case, it's not such a case, the Middle East is not such a case. Syria is gone. As you said, it's going to take decades if you know if everything going to happen to rebuild that country. It's just gone, and those, uh, uh, you know, and, and Turkey is, you know, has, as I have pointed out several times, has every strategic reason to move in there and make sure that you know it, 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 nothing happens in Syria that kind of threatens its integrity. So it's a very likely scenario of Tur Turkey take, continuing its offering operation. It has said, Erdogan has said so, leading generals have said so several times. We are going to continue. They are withholding for the moment because they don't want to clash with American special forces. But maybe that will happen as well. So many things that we thought were not going to happen have happened, have happened in the world and in the Middle East. So maybe that will happen as well. Second, I think. No, one, let me just a bit one second. I think it would. See, if you want to want, if you want to get the Americans out from there, you reduce the pressure. You said there is a lull now, there, there is a, there's more quiet now, and the reason for that could be strategic, because, because as long as there's, there's, there's some conflict and violence, the, the United States will remain. So if you want the United States to get out, you stop for a minute. Excuse me. But, but, but the thing is that we, kind of, we don't quite know what the American game plan is. The, and uh, that was not the Americans. American. We have to have the Americans. But another thing that you said about making the parallel to, to Afghanistan, now the difference, I think, a, a major difference between Syria and Afghanistan. You have all the problems, all the you know hellish scenarios. You can take them from Afghanistan, put them in Syria. On top of that, I would say, Syria has an additional represents an additional danger, in so far compared to Afghanistan, that you you can imagine a major war erupting there, involving powers, Israel, Iran, Turkey, United States, in a way, a major international conflagration taking place. And that is also, I see, as a very likely scenario in the coming years. And that is, you know, you have Afghanistan is still landlocked, limited, it has caused a lot of problems, but it has not caused the eruption of a major international war, regional war. And that risk is quite, quite considered, something that we need to consider in the coming okay. Thank you. I saw several hands. I, I have two questions. Yeah, but we we'll Second have. one, you did notice. Oh, sorry, you said something about Atatürk well, and Erdogan. Yeah. yeah, Erdogan is a good successor to, 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 to Atatürk. He says there, I, I, it's in the book, I don't have my reading glass, I can't read it right now, that uh, last year he, Erdogan spoke about Atatürk, a uh, great founder of our nation, we are continuing on, on, in, his, uh, in his footsteps, etc. So Erdogan is, you know, he is Atatürk's successor. Okay, so. Just to save time, and we will take a couple of questions. We start. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Naya Lanaza, Lund University, also Stockholm University. Um, I would like to add something about these complicated things about uh, that mentioned that more than 20 million of the Turks are Alevi Turks, not Alawite, not like Assad, but they have an other thing, and and uh, some of them feel as they are considered as Shia, but and if it's very complicated. Out of these 20 million, um, uh, 15, about 14, 15 are Turkish Alevis, and another five are Kurd Alevis. Out of 15 million Kurds, five are Alevis. And all, um, almost all the Kurds on the Syrian side are Alevi Kurds. And they are not trusted by the Sunni. So you have also a reason why it has been easier for Erdogan to work with the Iraqi Kurds because they are Sunni. And not, and, and that he has steep support of the 
quite a number of the Sunni Kurds, the majority of the Sunni Kurds mm. in Turkey. Mm. And, but not those who joined PKK or the uh, other organization regarding of the Syrian side, because they belong to another thing. And when you were showing the Sunni situation, and you mentioned uh, Netanyahu, the president, uh, prime minister, and with uh, with uh, Sultan Qaboos, there was another mistake done because Sultan Qaboos is Ibadi, and he is not Sunni, not Shia, and the Ibadis, the Iranians try uh, uh, to to uh, say you are more close to Shia than to Sunni, and I could myself when I participated in a big Ibadi conference, World Conference last year in Tokyo see that in front of me how the Iranians were trying to convince the Omanians to be on their side. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julian Tucker, Junior Research Fellow here at ISTP. I have two questions and I will try to keep them as concise as possible. Uh, the first question would be for you, Halil, about the future of the Idlib pocket specifically. When you talk about Turkey potentially annexing north, uh, territor more territory, in northern Syria, it seems to me like you're talking about the Syrian Democratic Forces controlled areas in the uh, northeastern part of the country, the north bank of the Euphrates. But what about the um, uh, coalition opposition control, the Islamist controlled Idlib pockets? What, what will become of that? And how are the people there likely to respond to Turkish annexation attempts? And more generally, in the future, uh, as part of these uh, reconstruction and reconciliation efforts that you talked about, how will the relationship between Moscow, Tehran, and Damascus fit in that? In other words, what policy options will be open to Demac uh, Damascus and the uh, Al-Assad regime in the future? And how will that color the international relations between uh, these foreign sponsors? Okay. Very briefly about the, uh, the Idlib. Now, that's a, it's not a problem because if you say opposition, use the right name. These are Islamist rebels there, uh, Al Qaeda forces or whatever. You, and, that's, it's, uh, no, and, and Turkey have used them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But now they have become a, you know, a, 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 um, a kind of problem for Turkey. And it's something that they're trying to, you know, it's, they are not going to annex. It's not, it's not part, it's the Kurdish region. The, the, mm -hmm. the Rojava is going to be. Um, that they are interested in controlling. When it comes to the rebel, they're, they're, they're you know, allies, or they're, they're you, they have to some, that they, I, I, I honestly don't think that the Turkish general staff knows what to do with them. It's a problem. How are we going to get them out of Syria? Who's going to take them? We don't want them. What are we going to do with these guys? You know, they, they are a danger, a threat. They, how are we going to deal with it? For, for now, on, they have reached kind of, they're trying to neutralize that question. Mm -hmm. But that is, of course, something that has to be, is a security issue. How do we mm -hmm. deal with these dangerous people? But to, they, 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 they are not, you know, the tools that, we, that, you know, it's not what they're going to use anymore. Mm -hmm. But they would kind of, ideally, you would create a reservation there, like for the Indians in America, you know, and create a fence around the Idlib, and then they can stay there. And I, I, I think that would be in everybody's interest, actually. But if that is, and that is actually what, what has been done right now, for the moment, temporarily, mm -hmm. you have this jihadi reservation there. Mm -hmm. So keep them there and make sure that uh, nothing bad comes out of it, for the moment. For the moment. Uh, I can give you a very short answer, mm -hmm. and that is uh, the main, uh, the, the, Iran and Russia shared the strategic interest in preserving the government of Bashar Assad, mm -hmm. and by defeating and destroying the Islamic State. Beyond that, I can see some differences in interests. And it, it's quite clear to me that uh, Iran and, and Russia may not share the same interests uh, for uh, the future of Syria. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, there, and, and I can see that happening. So Russia is not that happy with Iranian designs for, for Syria. Mm -hmm. They would like Bashar al-Assad to restore independence vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Iran. But Bashar al-Assad accumulated substantial debt to Iran. It's very difficult for him to tell Iran, go home, because this is perhaps what he would have liked to do. Mm -hmm. Russia is another story. So I can see uh, for, for the longer, longer run, uh, I can see some, uh, some conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. between both Bashar al-Assad and Russia and Iran. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, for, for Bashar al-Assad, 
the conflict between Iran and Israel over the Syrian border is a threat. The more the Iran, so this is this is now the equation here between between uh, Iran and, and Bashar al-Assad, Iran and Syria. It's a triangular type of relationship because one of the things that Israel told Russia, which I know about, is if Iran continues to try to dominate, to control Bashar al-Assad and build that permanent military presence in Syria, Israel will not, will not have any other choice but attack Assad. In other words, you have a confrontation between Assad and Israel. If you don't want that to happen, try to, number one, yourself to limit Iranian influence in Syria, and try to persuade also Bashar al-Assad to perhaps move a little bit away from Iran. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is behind that agreement, tacit agreement, we call it, right? Tacit agreement mm -hmm. between Israel and Russia, mm -hmm. that Israel is okay for Israel to attack Iranian interests in Syria mm -hmm. because this serves the interests of trying to distance Iran from Damascus. So Russia would like to, to solely mm -hmm. uh, dominate Bashar al-Assad, so to, to, control, to control Syria. Ideally, from an Israeli perspective, also there would be a reconstruction process in Syria that has as little, as little Iran in it as possible. Exactly. And perhaps then Chinese participation in the, in the Syrian reconstruction They are not so interested. They are not so much interested. Yeah. But what you are saying is really interesting uh, and shows that very clearly on the line what I said before. Russia is not the problem here. <laughs> well, no, I not, yes, not. But that, but that is news for Western audiences. Well, maybe you can Russia. 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 Happy note, Russia is not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> not here. <laughs> not here. Maybe somewhere else. Maybe the majority of ambassador just left. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you very, very much for a very lively uh, presentation and an even livelier discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.